All right, guys, you can't see Marco shorts, but I got to see them before we uh, stood up in our chairs and, and looked professional. Nice to see you, Marco. Thanks for pitching in. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Good to see you. I'm glad it's a pleasure. Um, it's I don't know if you have this experience. It felt like for the past couple of weeks, not a whole lot was going on. It was like Trump jury land and there's you know, some random stuff over here. And then this past week, it just feels like it's been an absolute dumpster fire of stuff. So I thought I'd check in with you and ask, well, let's just start at the top. How are you feeling about the economy right now? Um, how do you feel about the inflation print? How do like what what is striking your interest right now? You know, um, I had a target for S and P five hundred of five thousand five hundred, and so I'm I'm feeling good, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and the, and but but it was based on a view that there would be a slowdown in the U.S. economy, and of course that did not happen. I mean, first quarter was absolutely uh, on fire. And then inflation prints were very strong. And also, um, you know, there was just no sign of anything slowing down. Now, over the past week, this is the week of May. What was the Monday of this week? The May 12th, yeah, right? May 12th. Uh, 13th, yeah. sorry, May mm -hmm. 13th. We've had the inflation print come in. We've had some retail numbers come in. So consumer is slowing down a little bit as well. And that was more in line with my thinking what would happen, start hitting in Q1. And the reason that's so important is because my heretical view is that the Fed would pivot for political reasons, but they would be blessed with data that would sort of um, suggest that they were correct to uh, lean towards leniency. And so, of course, that view ended up being, you know, um, in trouble over the course of February and March and into April uh, because there was no sign of any slowdown. There was no data to confirm their view. And they they put themselves into a corner. They pivoted in December. They reaffirmed the three cuts in a March meeting that, quite frankly, was was you know pretty pretty shocking. I mean, there was like no hint of any slowdown at all. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to stick to our three uh, cuts. And then um, you know, come early May, they did a very dovish QT. And so there was just no real reason for any of this. And I think that we sort of entered this peak narrative that everything is fine and that they're going to have to hike. And I think that narrative really peaked when the 10-year yield hit about 4.75. Um, and so early this month in May, you know, I said, look, this is getting a little bit out of hand. Yes, I am, I've am. i been bullish for 18 months in the U.S. economy. I would, I would identify me as maniacally bullish. <laughs> but there are limits to the consumer, and we can talk about what those are. But the point is that we've gotten a little bit too much one-sided now where everybody's a bull, no one's a bear, Everyone's dismissing the bearish arguments, which weren't stupid. They were just early. And so uh, I suggested to my clients that tactically they go long duration in like two weeks ago. And that's actually the best thing that can happen for the equity market. Long story short, putting it in very, very simple, non-fancy terms, bad news is good news for the stock market. And we got some bad news. It breaks down the 10-year yield. And it justifies the Fed reaction function, which, quite frankly, without some slowdown, would be, um, you know, would be uncomfortably political, in my view. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the most recent CPI print, Rob and I talked about it last week. This is going to come out uh, just next Monday. Um, I don't know, like, uh, I mean, the media is trying to spin it as it was lower than expected and that prices were stagnant. I mean, you're still, we're still up 0.3% month on month. We're still up 3.4% year on year. And when you dig down into it, I mean, shelter, transportation, medical costs, electricity, I mean, we're well above 5% in all those categories for transportation and double digits. So I don't know that the consumer kind of looks good to me. I, I don't know how to bridge. I haven't I haven't figured out how to bridge the gap between the consumer complaining about high prices and yet completely ignoring them and continuing to spend like it's crazy. I mean, we had another GameStop rally this past week. I thought we were done with GameStop. Oh, no, so no, I don't... no, 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 <laughs> GameStop. So games. So just to be clear, uh, the, to have a GameStop rally, to have S&P 500 reach my, you know, 5,500, you need bad data. Just to be clear, so if you are right that the consumer is strong and there's no weakness, we will not have a 5,500. Why? Because the 10-year will continue to sell off, bond yields will go up, and that will hurt equities. And so I think that um, we need to unpack your other point, which is that the CPR print wasn't that you know really comforting to you and Rob, and also that 
the consumer is strong. And what I would say on that front is that um, a lot of the leading indicators specifically for rent do suggest that owner's equivalent rent will decline over the next six months. So I would say that I have pretty high conviction view that on that front will go down. And also, you know, you have this like, I think it's a New York Fed global supply chain index that is coming down. Some of the Red Sea stuff is has been articulated and is passing through now. So um, I think that inflation will continue for the next six months to either go sideways or slightly lower, which will breathe a sigh of relief to the sort of like, they must hike right now. That's the first. In terms of the consumer, um, you know, like I me, mean, we can break it down. Uh, the consumer, I mean, first of all, look, I've, I've been engaged in hand-to-hand -hand co combat in trenches with the bears. I've taken them all on and I've bested them all over the last 18 <laughs> months. And so like all sorts of arguments that you can say to me about why the consumer is healthy, I've said them, I've charted them, I've shown the data for the past 18 months. For example, uh, Americans don't pay mortgage rates that are, you know, mark to market. They're 30 year fixed. Got it. We know they have an uh, excess saving argument by the San Francisco Fed was stupid because they used the look back of last 10 years and the savings rate has not gone up. Got it. We know that now. Um, the idea that there's $3 trillion worth of stimulus still sloshing around household balance sheet. Got it. We know. The problem is this. Real wages are no longer rising as much as they were from middle of 2022 because inflation just can't go down that much. And it's not because inflation stick here is going to go back up. No, it's it's much more simpler and stupid. When you go from 10% CPI to 4, that's a massive gain in real wages. When you go from 4 to 3, meh, no one's going to really feel that, right? The second issue is that um, excess savings has finally started to run out. The San Francisco Fed was wrong by flagging it last year. I showed that their math was wrong because of the assumptions they used were just incorrect. The savings rate didn't go up, right? But it doesn't mean like there's not less cash on the balance sheet of many uh, households. There just is. Um, and then finally, I think that, um, you know, um, in terms of the consumption, the savings rate can't go lower. So last year, I used the low savings rate in a bullish sense, in that there's more excess savings of the savings rate than what was exhumed. The problem is that you can't really dip below 3.5%, which is where we are. I mean, historically, it's low. So real wage growth is flattening. Leading wage indicators are all turning down pretty significantly. So there's not more cash in hand every month because you're making more money. Your excess savings has kind of run out or close to it, depending what cohort you're in. And finally, you've already lowered the savings rate as low as you could. You're already YOLOing. You can't YOLO hit it further from a perspective of consumption. So what I would say, Jacob, is I, I have a very, very high conviction view that over the next six months, the U.S. consumer is just going to kind of look around and say, Meh, maybe I should pay down some of this credit card debt. Maybe I should pull back. It's not, it's not a reason to expect a recession you know, with some high probability is just the slowdown. And that's the only way you can remain bullish on equities. The only way you can remain bullish on assets, including silly stuff like monkey JPEGs, ape JPEGs, whatever. Uh, the only way you can really be bullish is if you have my view that the economy is going to slow down a little bit. Because if you think it's going to be the same as it was the last 12 months, where growth continues to surprise to the upside, man, the tenure is going to blow off. We're going to be at 5%, and then equities are going to come down because the Fed will have to hike. I hear you. Um, where does where does China fit into you here? It, it seems like there's been a sentiment sea change in just the last couple of weeks. I think the, since the last time you came on versus now, it's like everybody has sort of woken up that China is super cheap and that maybe China has sold off too much. And I mean, I, I hesitate to make too much of this because I feel like Bloomberg in some ways keeps itself going because every week it, it announces, oh, the Chinese are considering some new economic plan that is going to finally stimulate the economy. I'm looking um, for it right now. Yes. <laughs> well, there are actual details this week. So and this is not Bloomberg. This is the South China Morning Post has, OK, we're going to take forty one billion dollars and we're going to give it to SOEs and local governments and they're going to buy housing inventory and then sell it back as low cost housing. Um, and then in addition, we've got more cuts. Uh, for down payment ratios, more cuts for interest rates on loans tied to housing, um, 
removing the lower limit on mortgage rates for first and second homes. So like you start to put it together. I don't know whether to read that as Xi Jinping is like, God, we're still talking about the property thing. I have to do something here, even if it means getting back in bed with these property developers and SOEs, or if, he, if he's purged them all so much that he's like, great, like, let's get back to like the economy. We've got six months until whatever other shoe is going to drop in the US election. Like maybe we push forward here. How do you work China into this? I mean, I don't think you really work it into anything you know china is china um first of all i want to preface everything by saying just i got china massively wrong this year so i don't know why anybody on this podcast would really listen to me on this um you know i've i've been pretty bearish um and consistently arguing that the fundamentals haven't really changed china is in the middle of a secular stagnation i think the model for china will be the us from like 2009 to 2016 17. And so it's going to take some time for them to um, digest the housing uh, crisis. But the problem is the market hasn't really bought that. It's just gone up. Most of it is offshore, offshore foreign investors. Onshore investors, by the way, agree with this bearish view. Um, and that's because, you know, I, I have a pretty good insight into offshore um, manager community. My team speaks to a lot of them. Um, and yeah, I mean, like onshore investors have been very puzzled by why foreigners are so excited. Um, on the other hand, you know, sometimes when you get the market wrong, you need to pause and, and uh, like respect the market and ask, what was it getting right? And also st talking to people like locals, I think we all, always overemphasize that. They're, they're often the most bearish in a bearish environment. They're the last to see the sea change, whether it's Argentina, whether it's emerging any emerging market, you know, the domestic bearishness can sometimes just be, you know, people are PTSD from whatever it is that's been plaguing the country. So uh, the fact that foreigners are leading this uh, rally is not something I don't say that to scoff at it. What I would say to you, uh, Jacob, is that I, I don't think any of the measures that they've implemented are going to really turn around to the economy on a fundamental basis, but they they may put a bottom into it. And at the end of the day, isn't that all that Chinese assets really need, given how beaten down they are and given how cheap they are? Um, and I think there's a geopolitical element of this as well. I mean, Xi Jinping did go to San Francisco. He did go to Paris. I mean, he also went to Serbia and Hungary, but like, whatever. And so, you know, there's like, there all the arguments for why China is uninvestable have slightly, slightly moved to the other direction. And so that might be enough for some of this um, reorientation towards China. There's also two macro variables I wanna point out. India is really expensive. It is the most expensive market on the planet. You know, so, um, and you have another like election, it's like, eh, how much more can Modi deliver? So I think that's another issue. And then there's of course JPY decline. JPY has absolutely collapsed, hurting a lot of, so you have two ways to trade out of China. One, if you're an EM de dedicated investor, you went to India since 2021 and you bid up the cost of India. So now you're like, eh, hey, maybe I should rebalance a little bit at the first sign the Chinese policymakers are, uh, are stimulating. And then if you're a global go anywhere investor, you went to Japan because of that kind of diversifying away from China argument. And then you that's a really good trade. Japan's been up, but currency has really hurt your performance. And so I think those are also playing into this foreigner shift back to China at the first sign of stimulus. Uh, but I don't know. Like, again, I've been wrong for the whole year. So now that I'm saying like, yeah, I guess it makes sense. China will go beat out 30%. So who knows? Maybe maybe your listeners should just trade opposite of what I say on China. Uh, not, not necessarily. And I do think, I mean, if you're right about, about the U.S., like we probably should see sort of a turn to emerging markets. But I, I take your point on India, and um, we've talked about this a little bit, but I, I went and got the, the data. I mean, and this is one thing where COVID had an, un, an unexpected sort of positive impact. How many individuals do you think were Indian individuals were registered to trade on India's national stock exchange before the pandemic in March 2020? I have no idea. All right, it's 31 million out of a population of 1.4 billion. Within 12 months of the pandemic, that had gone up to 40 million, and today it's 90 million. Nice. So you've basically tripled the level of Indians who are actually trading stocks. Um, it's still like equities are still a very small 
share of the pie for Indians. Um, they care more about things like bank deposits and gold and, and things like that. But like if you look over the past 10 years, the share that equities in, in Indian accounts has doubled from 2.2% to almost 5% in general. So the weird thing about India is... I think it's driven by the Indian retail consumer. I don't think it's actually like everybody's interested in India from the macro perspective, but I think the reason the valuations have gotten so high and why it's so scary to people like you and me is we want to believe the narrative. We do believe the narrative, but the price action like tells me, God, are all these Indians just like, you know, YOLOing whatever funds they have into corrupt stocks that are backed by the state and everything else like that. That's what sort of disturbs me about India. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, that is also, of course, um, a reason you want active management by Indians in India. Because if anyone cannot perform a retail-driven market, it would be on sh onshore domestic active managers. So, you know, shout outs to all the um, domestic investors out there that are raising capital. One thing I want to say uh, on China, um, here's, here's what I want to ask you. You know, what model should we apply to China and its stimulus? And this is something that's a, that's a really interesting debate to have. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the camp that has always said that the big bazooka stimulus is three to six months away, every three to six months. Um, and, uh, and I've started to reconsider that. And again, maybe I'm a counter indicator on China. So like, feel free to make fun of me in the comments below. Um, but like, you know, to what extent does China really need to panic? Um, to what extent does it need to turn the ship around? And I ask that because is the model for China really Mediterranean Europe during the Euro area crisis? And you know, you and I were at Strat for it at the time. We were colleagues. Um, I was in charge of Europe, and I remember that every single colleague of mine and every commentator in the Anglo-Saxon world was saying, like, look, Mediterranean Europe will absolutely have an orgy of violence because youth unemployment is north of forty percent. Right, right, right. And I dug into my like memory of my homeland of Serbia, where youth unemployment is 80%. And if you have a job and you're under 30, you're a loser. Because you haven't figured out how to game the system. You know, you wake up at 1 p.m., you have a couple of espressos, you go clubbing until 5 a.m. You know, you have a nice little piesca at the end of the uh, revelry, and you go back uh, and you sleep uh, in the apartment with your parents. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's all good. Like, why would you have a job? And... Uh, I mean, that's a, that's the funny way to articulate it. But in Spain and Italy, a lot of the under 30 year olds did live with their parents. And uh, also politically, they were just like a very small cohort. So nobody truly cared about them. You know, like it was just like, oh, you're going to protest about jobs. Yeah, too bad. Like, we don't really care. Baby boomers are who we care about. They are the large cohort. Well, China is like a supercharged version of that. Uh, of, of that context, you know, in China, because of single um, or one child policies, you have, you know, millennials who are basically taken care of by their parents and four sets, like four grandparents per one child, number one. And number two, they're, they're even smaller of a political cohort in a non-democratic society. So when, when we hear all these stories of Gen Z and millennials in China, like lying flat and being like angst filled and all this stuff. And, and, you know, I talk to millennials in China too, that they all tell you how, how they're not very happy about the future and so on. But like, who really truly cares? If you're a member of the Chinese Communist Party, this is not the cohort you care about. You care about the baby boomers. And the thing about the baby boomers and some Gen X, they bought their condos in 2011 and 2012. So they good. <laughs> you know what I mean? There you go. They bought Bitcoin at 2000 bucks. So whether it's 60 or 30, they're like, eh, I'm good. I'm going to retire. I got my condos. Even if prices decline 80%, I'm still in the money. Millennials got suckered in, in 2015 and 16, by the um, Shantytown redevelopment scheme. And they are the ones that bought Bitcoin at 30, 40K. So they really care about like where it is. They're, they're, they're in trouble if there is a decline back to some limit. Uh, but again, there's such a small cohort that I'm just not sure that there's a political pressure on Chinese uh, policymakers to really stimulate with a big bazooka. And so now they're doing a lot. Let's see what happens to total social financing. The problem is industrial credit is rolling over, by the way. So a lot of the bank lending that was happening that was going to industrials that offset decline in real estate has actually started to roll over. Um, and so I think that from a total social financing perspective, I, I don't expect a surge. I expect basically a very flat, at best, uh, credit 
new credit creation in China. Yeah, I mean, I make you look good on China because I've been positive for China for like, I don't know, 36 months. Like I keep on think I keep on thinking things are going to get better. And my the only saving grace is that Rob and the other guys at CI have held me in line. Their arguments have been better than my arguments. So we actually have gotten China right on the trading front, but not because of me. It's because I had people around me who were telling me I was an idiot and I appreciate them. So I'm I'm sort of always I, I'm not quite a China perma bull, but I sort of have this reflexive contrarianness to how people think about, oh, like they're not innovating and the Chinese Communist Party is an authoritarian sclerotic dictatorship and China is going to collapse in on itself. Like, I just hate that argument because I don't think that it's actually there. Um, I mean, I, I'd be the first to admit they have problems and that she is struggling to do the thing that he needs to do, which is encourage more consumption from the lower rungs of society, the hundreds of millions of people who are still in the interior. And when you start breaking down like how the Chinese consumer is behaving, um, like one of the most interesting things I've read in the last couple of weeks um, is that, you know, Chinese coffee consumption has something like doubled in just the last couple of years to where now China is, I forget, it's, it's the seventh largest coffee consumer in the world and it's quickly rising up the charts. Um, there was another, this is sort of in my file of articles I read every week that's like not geopolitically important, but it's interesting. Um, th there's a Chinese thirst for rosewood and other tropical woods that can be used for furniture. Um, and that thirst is so great that it's edged out ivory and other things in Mozambique. So you've got these Chinese consumers that are like creating a black market for tropical rosewood in Mozambique. Where you've it's got, apparently like, these... fueling insurgencies and, and conflict in Mozambique too. So I know it's like just because Chinese demand for nice furniture is there. So like the Chinese consumer is doing something. It's not like they're they're going nowhere. Um, and then the last, I think I've already referenced this on the podcast too, but like I have not talked to that many Chinese millennials, but. I mean, Peter Hessler is still like one of the best English language sources I think you can get out there about what's going on in China. And he had an amazing article in the New Yorker surveying some of his students in China. He teaches English in China and surveying some of his former students. And I mean, he, he had a couple of things that really rang true. He sort of, he said what you just said in different ways. He said, look, when you think about the people who are 40, 50 years old in China right now, think about where they were 40, 50 years ago. Their lives are way better than they could have possibly imagined. And the only real danger moment for Xi was probably that brief month, what was that, a year or two ago, where you had people coming out and protesting against wealth management products and stopping to pay their mortgages and things like that. Like that was a system, like a moment where the system had to stop and respond, but you're not getting that right now. And most of the society, the older people who actually make things happen, like they're fine. Like in Peter Hessler's like informal survey of some of them, they cared about like, you know, are they going to find a girlfriend? Are they going to get a job that they want after like all that kind of mundane stuff, not about any of the grand political stuff. The one thing he did say was, you know, the generation that is coming of age now that is just graduating, like they've had more contact with the outside world than any Chinese generation maybe ever. And when they are exposed to freedoms around identity or technology or all these other things in foreign countries, like sometimes they want to stay. Sometimes they don't want to go back home because it sort of opens their horizon. And you could maybe make the argument that that's the beginning of some kind of class that's going to challenge Xi in the long run. But I think you're exactly right. Like Xi has already gotten rid of all the challengers um, and he's dealing with a society that is probably thankful for the position that it's it's reached right this point. So I maybe the policy thing is is not as strong as it needs to be. And he's already shown that when it does get to that level, when you had the mortgage protests and things like that, like they respond in kind. So I, I'm I'm with you. Let, let's be China permables. I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I mean uh, look, it's it's a problem. Uh, it, it's there's a tactical story about China, and then there's a more structural. I think you're talking about being bullish structurally because there's innovation. There's uh, there's more political stability and so on. Tactically, though, tactically to be really bullish China, I almost want there to be instability so that they would do a fiscal big bazooka and yeah. arrest secular stagnation. You know, and and so that's where it's it's a struggle for me because I don't see that happening, and I, I don't see these measures as really turning things around. I mean, at the end of the day, China is mirrored in the same situation we were in 2009, 10, 11. I mean, in, I mean exactly the same. I don't see how you're going to incentivize households to buy a condo. I think there's like zero chance. The Chinese people are not stupid. They see prices declining massively. Even if the government arrests them by like taking supply off the market, you know, you're not going to want to buy another one. Like why would real estate go up? So this is exactly like the US in 2009, 10, 11. There's household deleveraging and it's very difficult to encourage households to borrow 
even at 0% interest rates, as was the case in the US. Um, so that's the first issue. Um, the second issue is that, um, you know, there's there's a concern that a lot of the things that have been going right in China could be impacted negatively by geopolitics. So specifically export of industrial production. Uh, there's, you know, tariffs that could be put on. Um, also, just the fact that, um, you know, I do think U.S. consumers are going to slow down over the next six to 12 months. Again, it doesn't have to be, we don't have to use the R word, just a slowdown, just like, you know, like consolidation. You know, people look at it, oh, I've yoloed a little too much. So that that could also negatively impact outside of geopolitics, uh, just the one thing that's worked. By the way, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever had uh, Zach Dichtwald on your show. Um, he's the author of Young China. Great, great young guy. I mean, he's been living in, in China for a long time, speaks fluent Mandarin and wrote the book called Young China. He's sort of the expert on Chinese millennials. I think you should definitely have him on the show and, and talk about these things. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll reach out. I, I, I think you're exactly right that there's no way to incentivize people to buy more Chinese condos, which is why the government is waving the white flag and, you know, ponying up billions of dollars for the SOEs and the local governments to do so, which is sort of ironic. But, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to juxtapose it with India, because I think one of the things that would be good for China is if the is if you incentivize Chinese people to buy Chinese equities. That's happening in India without anybody having to do anything in India. It just sort of is part of the, the natural system. And Chinese people, for good reason, are skeptical of being involved in Chinese equities because it's more of a casino than it is a real stock exchange. And I do think like of all the, the policy statements and the circulars and this, that, or the other thing that's happened over the last five months in China, there was one that stuck out to me about you know, mature capital markets, mature equity markets, getting rid of corrupt companies from the exchanges, normalizing it as an investment in Chinese society. And by 2030 to 2035, making it so that the Chinese stock market is something that the average Chinese investor would want to invest in. And I think that's so crucial in terms of performance, because I think you're exactly right. Like every from a foreign sentiment level, so many people are scared off by China that like there's a limit on how far or how much like foreign money is going to go in there. Like I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a client or potential client who we talk about an, interna interna an international strategy. And at the end they say, oh, by the way, I don't want to invest in any Chinese companies. And it's like, well, if, if you want to like capture growth over the next five to 10 years, even if China's democratic, like take all the bad arguments about China and say they're true. Like they're still the ones that are at the apex of industrial production in the world right now. Like there's going to be explosive growth from some Chinese companies who are going to be at the forefront of some of these things. So if you're just ignoring them, like you're leaving an awful lot on the table. Um, anyway, anything else? Yeah, just one last thing. Uh, somebody sent uh, the recent sort of data point that three of the four most downloaded uh, apps on Android phones are Chinese made, uh, Timo, TikTok, and Shane. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, there's this... Uh, it's you know it's not just industrialization it's also i mean everyone's talking about ai and how us has left china behind but here they are um you know creating a an alternative to amazon creating an alternative to youtube and facebook and i think that's that's really interesting um there's a lot of innovation as you say in china for sure and uh, um the problem is that you know how do you get a piece of that innovation and normally the way to do that would be to deploy capital in china on a, in the private markets you know to, to try to take stakes in in venture um the problem with that is that the structure of private market investing is such that you have to have illiquid lockups for seven to ten years and you know i absolutely think china's investable on a tactical public market basis absolutely i mean i miss this rally i'm an idiot i'm sorry like I, it hurts me it pains me and I, and I can't not say it and shout it from the mountaintop i missed the rally in chinese stocks but i never thought that china's uninvestable the problem is that when you get into this private space and you're asked to lock up capital for seven to ten years even the biggest private uh, permable, you know, it's just so difficult. And so that's the problem, Jacob, that what we are okay to invest in is meh, you know, public equities in China, fine. But like the real source of awesomeness and youth and innovation is private. How do you lock up capital in China for seven to 10 years? Yeah. Although, 
I mean, that's sort of true of the United States too. Like the real growth that's happening in the United States is, you know, if you want exposure to nuclear power and things like that, you can't, you're not going to go to a publicly traded utility. Yes, like you have to go. You have and, like, no, 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 no. So of course it's true. Of course it's true. There's, there's great data that shows that uh, there's less and less public market uh, stocks, by the way, like the IPOs are slowing down from the nineties. We actually have less listed companies today than we did in 1999. But the difference, Jacob, is of course seven to ten year lockup in the U.S. You're not really worried about regime risk. You're not really worried about like complete bifurcation and de-risking because you're in the U.S. With China, you know, like you just don't know what happens over the next seven to ten years. There could be pretty binary, sudden death kind of moments, stroke of pen risks. Um, Although, you know, well, like you never know. <laughs> January I was going <laughs> to ask, like, do you have any regime risk fears in the United States over the next seven to ten years? Yeah, Any? well, there you go. I mean, fair, fair. I mean, you know, I, I, but you know, most of the people listening I mean, no, to this, no, but not fair. Like, you came on the podcast right after January sixth, and you told, like, I was like, oh my god, this is the stab in the back moment. We're gonna look back on this moment, and it's gonna be like, and you told me not to worry. Please tell me that you're not worrying now, because I'm gonna have to really get. I'm, I'm gonna have to really. I'm not. Yeah. I'm really not. I, I, I am not. I'm not worried. Um, I, I did say that. I'm, I'm very proud of myself too for having taken the cold shower and told you not to worry. But look, everybody, everybody is worried. I just think that that's that's kind of manufactured, um, you know, establishment concerns. You have an anti-establishment candidate, so of course he has to be be Isabob. You know, he has to be Satan. That's just how it is. Whether it's the U.S. or any other country, if there's an anti-establishment candidate, he's going to be seen as as a regime risk i don't think there's regime risk in the u.s but nonetheless because most of our listeners are americans and not chinese you know we are domiciled in the u.s dollar for for us we're stuck here even if there is regime risk whereas china is on the other side so if if you're if you're a chinese listener like just ignore me and put all your money in private markets in china you'll be fine you know but like for the rest of us not clear that we will be fine because and not just because of decisions made by Chinese regime, but also the decisions made by the U.S. regime that may make those investments completely illegal. And how do you unwind them when they're illiquid? You you know you have to find someone to take your investment on a secondary market where you're going to be basically completely discounted by some local investor who's going to you know fleece you and take your shirt. So that's the problem. All right, moving on. Um, I'm gonna. Th- three things that caught my eye in in Europe this week that I want to ask you about. And it's going to be big deal, little deal, no deal. I'm going to give you all three and you get to take it and run. You can do all three, whatever you want. So number one, the week started off with uh, Vladimir Putin replacing his his defense minister with an economist, uh, Andrei Belusev, I think is his name. Second, we've got the news that Russia pushed into a lot of areas around Kharkiv, Um, and gained more territory in terms of square miles in the beginning of the war. Still not a ton of territory, but like seemed to bust, not bust through, that's the wrong way to say it. They they claimed some villages, they made some progress, they're forcing the Ukrainians to stretch their defenses thin. Is this a sign that maybe the Ukrainians are on the back foot? And then uh, Robert Fico, shot by an an assassin who, uh, all we know about him is that he's old and that he authored three works of poetry in his life. So I don't know if you're worried about warrior poets out here coming for for leaders of foreign states, but big deal, little deal, no deal for these three things. What does no deal mean? It just doesn't matter, right? Yeah, like we're not even gonna waste time talking about it. All right, let's start with the last one, Fico. I'm gonna say no deal. Okay. A 71-year-old poet shoots somebody who wants to shut down a Slovak version of PBS. I think we know why he got (laughs) shot. And just, you know, you, you don't 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 try to shut down PBS. You know you don't know how many uh, poets and I, I will say when, when and... he first got when he first got shot, I was like, oh my god, is it a migrant? Was it a jihadist? Was it a Ukrainian nationalist? Like any one of those could have made it a thing. Yes. But yeah, once it was once it was the warrior poet. I uh, I mean the pen is mightier than the sword, right? Yikes. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I I think this is kind of like uh, yeah, I think that's a no deal. I think. Um, the replacement of the defense minister in Russia, I think it's a little deal. I mean, I get it. He's like economist. They're gearing for a war economy. That's like, that's the message. And fine, like, you know, um, sure. Um, but it's kind of already the case. And then the final one is like the pushing to Kharkiv. I think it's, I think it's between little deal and a big deal. You know, am I buying oil and U.S. treasuries and gold because of it? No. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I think it's clear what the Russians are doing. They are trying to, I mean, the conventional view of what's going on is that they're trying to stretch Ukrainian defenses. And I don't see why that would be wrong. But let me just remind everyone that over the last like six months that we've been inundated with this whole narrative that Ukrainians are out of munition, that they don't have the ability to fight, that if we don't give all our tax dollars to Ukraine, uh, freedom will cease to exist on planet Earth. Like during those six months, the Russians have gained like what, 20 kilometers on the front line in Donetsk. So the competency of the Russians is greatly overstated, has been for two years now. And even in this moment of Ukrainian pain, they have only managed to really push the front in Donetsk by about 20 kilometers in distance. That's it. So, yeah, I mean, they're trying to stretch the Ukrainians as much as possible. In my view, what's what's happening here is that I, I still maintain that Putin wants to wrap this up. I think he wants to repurpose that mission accomplished banner from George W. Bush. And <laughs> I think sure he wants to... <laughs> Yeah, and I think he wants to, but but he can't because he promised Donbas, and Donbas is a is a amalgamation of two oblasts, Luhansk and Donetsk, and for some strange reason that really is difficult to understand, one of the largest and most sophisticated militaries in the world has been incapable of conquering the most pro-Russian, most ethnically Russian part of Ukraine, which is the half of Donetsk. It still hasn't conquered. Since 2014, I mean, it's been 10 years, 10 years, and Russia has not been able to do this. They need it. If Putin wants to end this war, he needs to deliver Donbass within the borders of Luhansk and Donetsk. And so that half of that oblast, not the city of Donetsk, the state, the oblast of Donetsk, it needs to be conquered. It, like, that is your end of the war. And so I think that's what this uh, incursion to Kharkiv is meant to accomplish. That's interesting. I mean, so do you think that we're a step closer towards the end of the war as we know it, that he can, once he gets control of, of Donbass, that maybe we will get some kind of, I mean, it's it's always going to be a frozen conflict, probably. But I mean, do you think we're headed that direction? Well, um, it's a uh, frozen conflict, you know, once both sides agree, it's, it's kind of frozen. And Russia obviously doesn't agree it's frozen. It's continuing its offensive. So what's our hint of the hierarchy? You know, I think I've talked about this on your podcast before, but like Russians have a hierarchy of uh, <clears throat> of what they care about in terms of conquered territories. Number one is Crimea. They annexed it. Um, like, you know, it's it's like, it's Russia. As far as they're concerned, it's Russia. Now, these four other oblasts, Kherson, which is north of Crimea, Zaporizhia, which is like the, the land bridge between Kherson and Crimea and Donbass, and then Luhansk and Donetsk. How did they annex them? I think it was at the end of 2022. Don't quote me on this, but when Kremlin issued the annexation order, it was unclear. And journalists asked the spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, like, hey, what did you mean by this annexation? And the way he articulated it was this. We're annexing Don Donetsk and Luhansk within their constitutive borders as oblasts of Ukraine. Like, we, we believe these borders are now borders of a new region in Russia. But Kherson and Zaporizhia, we will leave it up to voters at a future date to determine what borders they're going to um, um, sort of be annexed into Russia with. So what that tells you is that Kherson is purely serving a purpose as a buffer to Crimea and source of water. Zaporizhia is purely serving a purpose as a land bridge to Kherson and Crimea. But Donetsk and Luhansk kind of are on that same hierarchy as Crimea. Like, we want these borders. And so what does that mean? It means that when they withdrew from the city of Kherson and everyone was like, oh my god, Ukrainians are winning, they were like, yeah, whatever, we don't really care. We just want the water and the buffer so you guys can have the city of Kherson. Zaporizhia, even if Ukrainians launched an offensive and all that was left was like a coastal road, I kind of think Russians would be okay with that. But with Donetsk and Luhansk, it's pretty clear that they have a political objective that this is Donbass, this is Novo Novaya Russia, and they want it. You know, they want the whole thing. So, yeah, I think politically it's very difficult for Putin to end the war and put the mission accomplished better without all of the borders. And so to answer your question, I do think that the conflict will be near its, not end, but sort of terminal stage where it becomes officially just frozen once... Kremlin gets what's it, what it wants, and it really wants it half of Donetsk. I mean, if we can show a map, you know, we could, 
it's very clear that they haven't conquered. Like it's it's a real sore spot for Moscow that they haven't been able to wrap up. Again, what's the most pro-Russian, ethnically Russian part of Ukraine? And it's quite astonishing they haven't been able to beat the Ukrainians out of the nets. Yeah. How do you square that with um, all of Macron's recent, um, I don't know, I mean, masculinity about France's military forces potentially helping Ukraine or how Europe needs to be more muscular and France needs to lead them? Because, I mean, he's not talking like somebody who thinks the conflict is going to slow down anytime soon. No, I, I think that's uh, in the context of the upcoming you know, presidential election in, in France, uh, which is going to be very contentious. And, uh, you know, um, his opposition, uh, you know, Le Pen and her basically party have managed to really temper themselves on almost every issue. Like, there's no more Euroskeptic. I mean, they are Euroskeptic in a classical, the goalist way. But it's not about breaking down the EU. It's not about leaving NATO. It's not about uh, leaving the Euro. It's... Um, you know, it's just kind of center-right goalism. And so what is a one differentiating factor between Macron and his center-right rivals? And I think it is this position of Russia. It's a real sore spo spot for anyone associated with the Le Pen family. Like the truth is they took loans out from Russian banks to finance their campaign. Now, uh, you know, Marie Le Pen has said, well, it's not my fault. They were the only banks that were willing to give us loans. Um, you know, so like, okay, fine. Um, but it is something that I think Macron really wants to differentiate himself from his opposition. And that's, I, I would, I would look at it from that domestic political context. I'm not sure that there's anything more. That said, I think the whole European, you know, rearming and, and having a more of a forceful for, uh, policy is, is something France has done in the past, even with Sarkozy. So yeah, I think that's kind of par for the course. Right now in our international strategy, we're overweight France and we're underweight Germany. Do you think we're crazy? No, I think that's that's all right. I think that's good. Um, I would monitor very carefully energy costs because I think if they um, if they start collapsing, I think in Europe, which I think they will, maybe not next six months, but next twelve to eighteen months, you know, that will be very positive for Germany. Yeah, I, I have I have I have January twenty twenty six on my calendar as as when Germany starts looking appetizing again from that point of view. But that might be too late. That's really specific. Well, I just I just mean the year twenty twenty six. I feel like it, I feel like it's going to be bad for twenty four and twenty five and twenty six is when things will start to get better. I think your listeners probably have heard me loud European competitiveness way too many times, so it's it's not necessary. But I think it's good. I mean, look, France has domestic consumption, um, unlike Germany. So it doesn't have to really depend on China or US consumers. Um, and I, I think both of those economies have the type of sectors and companies that should be competitive in a CapEx led cycle. You know, And finally, uh, European planes just don't have doors fly off of their hulls <laughs> in the mid flight. So I'll just, nobody has, uh, nobody has become religious because of Airbus. Let me just tell you that. Yeah. And and I I mean, I know people in America who are who are looking at the flights before they book them. Is this an Airbus or Boeing? And they're going for the Airbus. So did you hear you did you hear that I think Travelocity or somebody else has now uh, uh, one of the filters is like the type of aircraft you will be flying? Yeah. I'm I'm sure. Like you can do that on I mean I I usually fly Delta. Delta you can you can screen that before you get on. And I actually That's too they, much. They, they changed it on me, actually, and I called them and said, I'd like a refund because I initially chose this this plane and you've now switched the planes. And they gave me the refund. So it might no. just be because I fly too many miles with them. But wow. Yeah. Squeaky wow. wheel gets that's the oil, next, Mark. That's the next level, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Before we get to basketball, there was one thing I, I needed a cold shower on and, and you're just the man to give it. Um, did you read, I, I don't know if you read uh, Donald Trump's interview with Rolling Stone a couple weeks ago where... Um, they talked to multiple sort of people in the U.S. government um, and at least one Republican lawmaker who said that Trump is talking about deploying with or without Mexican government approval U.S. military assets and special ops units into Mexico to assassinate drug cartel leaders and go after Mexico's drug cartels. And I sort of like I was already worried about U.S.-Mexico relations because of tariffs and what the future of USMCA is going to be if Trump gets in. And it's no longer AMLO, who is chummy with 
with uh, Trump. It's going to be Claudia Scheinbaum, and that's like a recipe for disaster. And then I read this thing about, oh, my God, we're going to deploy special forces down to Mexico. Tell me that your constraint-based model tells us that it's impossible for Trump to actually do this, and it's just something crazy that Rolling Stone published for clicks. Because I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, he could he could do that. Like, could tell me yeah. he can't. No, I mean, he definitely can. Uh, by the way, the part where I uh, get cold showers, that's for special subscribers only. So you have, oh, that's yeah, the yeah, next yeah. year. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to start a Patreon just for that, for cold just showers. Just for that. <laughs> no, but look, uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, that's been a meme. That's been sort of a meme within the uh, right wing, more right wing than conservative, but there's been a lot of chatter in that community about using military, of course, against Mexico. So I think Trump is just kind of rolling with what's been a very successful narrative meme, you know, cause um, for many uh, on the right in the US. And so he's just following up with that. Now, would he actually do it? I have no idea. I think that would be very difficult to execute. And one of the reasons is that law enforcement in the U.S. has really good relationship with certain elements of Mexican law enforcement. So there's some really, really good, um, you know, um, um, sort of interagency cooperation on the border, not with locals usually. It's usually the federal, um, the federal authorities in Mexico. And so I think that, you know, um, Trump does listen to law enforcement. And he listens to ICE, and he listens to border uh, patrol people and uh, uh, border services. So I, I think that they would sit him down and say, like, look, we don't want to anchor our counterparts. We work with them very closely. And, and they're actually, you know, they're struggling against corruption. They're struggling against uh, infiltration by cartels. We need to help them. We don't want to undermine them. And so I don't think it will happen, but I, it won't happen because, um, you know, I think, the, you know, the U.S. side, law enforcement will explain to Trump why this is a very bad idea. Um, that said, uh, it's a cool uh, plot of a movie that was already made. So, I mean, if we can get, who was it? <laughs> Benicio Del Toro? Who was like the yeah, guy? Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, if we can get him, like, why not, right? It's like, win-win. So, I've seen that too, that maybe maybe Trump like watched Sicario for the first time and now he's like obsessed with, uh, which, hey, it's a great movie. <laughs> That's, let's do it. But listen, but one thing I will say about this is, again, there are ways to do exactly what he says that would be in line with previous U.S. Um, involvement in Mexico. So, you know, um, there are ways to do exactly what he says, just less Hollywoody, And that would mean a greater interagency cooperation across the border, having actual American DEA or FBI agents in Mexico helping with investigations. These are things that like Mexicans will be extremely sensitive to. But if it's done in clandestine ways under the table, you know, like I can imagine, I can see a program being run while Trump is in power where he basically claims that he is doing what he said in an interview. And this is the thing about Trump. Like a lot of things that he says, he says it in a way that sets people off the wrong way, right? I mean, the immigration debate was the best one. Uh, the best example of this. I mean, he was so stuck about building a wall and then, you know, calling immigrants all sorts of uh, names. But when he proposed his actual immigration, like, reform, it was basically copy-paste of, I mean, I'm being facetious here for time, but, like, it was copy-paste of Canada's program. And then the left accused it of being racist. Well, I can assure you, as a Canadian who happened to be born somewhere else, Canadian immigration program is not racist. Like it, it may be many other things, but it is not racist. So if America became more like Canada on immigration, I think that would probably be a good thing. But the problem is that he had already poisoned the well with rhetoric that then his proposals, which may have been quite centrist or center-right, uh, ended up being seen as, as, as quite inappropriate. And I think the, this is another example of that, where he is describing basically a scenario out of a Benicio del Toro Sicario movie. But in reality, there is a way to enhance U.S.-Mexico cooperation where the U.S. aids in some of these operations. Um, so, All right. I won't call that a cold shower, but it, it was lukewarm. I'm, I'm a little bit braced, so I appreciate that. Um, all right, before we go, it's uh, we're recording Friday, May 17th. This will come out on Monday or Tuesday at the latest. So oh, the no. Nuggets and, and Timberwolves will have played game seven You're putting by the, the time spot. this comes out. So we're gonna we're putting ourselves both on the spot. I was in Minnesota a couple weeks ago at an event, um, and at the dinner beforehand, 
um, this was before the series began, they asked me, do you think that the Wolves have a chance against the Nuggets? And I said, no, I, I think the Nuggets are going to win. And for the first two games, I looked like an idiot. And they were all emailing me being like, hey, like you're some expert. Like you said, we didn't have a chance. And I was like, all right, I don't know. Like Ant looks good. They got the look. And then I emailed them back, of course, after the next two games saying like, yeah, like a little too early to be celebrating. Um, Nuggets got blown out of the gym uh, yesterday. Uh, where, where do you think we're, well, for, I have two questions. Number one, where do you think game seven is going? And number two, um, the way Jokic is abusing Rudy Gobert, I mean, this is how Serbia thanks France for its help during world war one. I. I mean, this is just absolute uh, lack of gratitude on, on behalf of the Joker for, for That's the always been the case. Every, everything that they've done, you know, he's never, he's never been able to defend him. Look, I, I'll say two things. First of all, defending champion, three-time MVP, home court, mile high. You know, if you're not betting on the Nuggets, you're a Timberwolves fan. Like, you know, and, and I think what the Timberwolves have done is extraordinary, but um, Edwards is like 22 years old. We're comparing him to MJ. He looked terrible in those, like, basically two games, last two games, tired, played 45 minutes a, a game. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, I think I think Denver basically... Th- the problem with Denver is they remind me of those early 2000s Lakers teams. With, you know, the switch, the famous switch. And that's part of the reason is that Jokic kind of is like Shaq. He just gets disinterested. He starts making stupid turnovers and he, he he tries to get his teammates like more involved than he should. Just go and get your big butt in the paint and forget about everything else. But um, so that's, I, I mean, I have to take the Nuggets, you know. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, Jamal Murray started one for 11 in game six. And I feel like every game they've lost, it's because Jamal Murray didn't show up. So I I don't think Jokic can do it by himself. He's going to need like one of the sidekicks to come up. So like if Murray has another game like that and he's throwing heating pads all over the gym, like, yeah, it could get bad. But assuming Murray just has like a normal game, like he doesn't have to play amazing. If he's just like, you know, four for 11 rather than one for 11, it's hard for me to imagine uh, that the Wolves can do much. The the Anthony Edwards, Michael Jordan thing, um, he, he's not Michael Jordan, and it's it's too soon. But I will say, he looked, and he doesn't act like him. He has a completely different personality. But like the way he shoots, the way he posts up, the way he moves, the way his body, yeah. he, looks, he looks like MJ. He's the first like NBA body to me that looks like, like Kobe had all the moves, but he was kind of long and, and lengthy like compared to Michael. Like Anthony has that kind of, I don't know how, what, how to describe it, but like go look at Michael in like the late 90s and look at Anthony and it's like the body type is the same. It's weird. But you know, I think um, there's there's a there's a bigger geopolitical discussion to be had about what just happened in the playoffs. You know, um, I don't know if you follow Gilbert Arenas's high quality podcast, <laughs> but he said something mid season, and it was like we should ban Europeans from basketball from the NBA. They've kind of ruined the game. Uh, I think he inferred that the refs in the NBA was trying to make it easier for them to succeed, um, and then. You know, the All-Star game shows up. Nobody cares. Adam Silver is handing over the trophy. He looks really, really angry. And they change the rules. Like, clearly, they change the rules. And the rules become what Bill Simmons has referred to as prison ball. And it's like, who does this hurt? You know, and I think it hurts the more sort of skilled team game. Because what you do when you start hand-checking and when basically you like, you let, uh, who is it, um, you know, uh, Timberwolves, uh, McDaniels, you you let him hump J- Jamal Murray's leg <laughs> the entire length of the court. What you do is you interrupt teams that pass a lot. So if you have a passing offense predicated on a lot of movement, a lot of screening, and you suddenly allow shoving and moving and stuff like that, you descend the game into basically like who can pull up a mid-range jumper, which obviously Anthony Edwards is amazing at. Like Jokic, not necessarily. Jokic has to be reprogrammed. He needs to realize it's the 1990s, and he needs to not leave the paint in this scenario, right? Same with, I mean, Doncic's big, slow, maybe he can, but nah, not really. Like, if you can punish Doncic the entire length of the court, he will get hurt too. Golden State Warriors. I don't think Golden State Warriors win a single ring. I mean, fine, the KD Warriors were next level, but you know, like, the, the, the KD less Warriors, I don't think they win a single ring in this prison ball world because they have too much movement. And so what am I getting at? There was a moment there where the Nuggets were down 0-2 and the Mavs were down as well to the Thunder. There was a moment when I thought to myself, huh, interesting. 
maybe we are at the end of this European era. Because they come in with lots of skill, you know, they're, they're not one-on-one. Like, that's not what necessarily their style of play is about. It's about sharing the ball. It's about, like, passing. It's about this and that. Um, and then, then Jokic was like, nah, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. The Europeans can play this way, too. And it's like, who are the, the best <laughs> European? Like, Jokic can do that. Like, fine, he'll play with you. Wembanyama is, like, probably going to be, like, the best player in the history of the NBA. And he doesn't, he's not a pass-first guy, necessarily. He's going to shove it down your throat. But, so, uh... but, but I would say you need to abandon the complicated offense. And I think that's the thing. Rick Adelman's style of movement, of offense, Steve Steve Kerr style of offenses. These offenses don't work when you have hand checking, when you can hump someone's leg for, you know, the entire length of the court, where you can pull jerseys around the screens and stuff like that. And so you need one-on-one players. And so that what that means is that, yeah, actually, Luca, I've always said Luca should do this and that. No, he should become more like James Harden. Like now in this in this world, he needs to dominate even further. And Jokic needs to just forget about getting his teammates involved. To your point about Jamal Murray. By the way, Jamal Murray was not there in game five either. I mean, he was efficient, but he, he didn't score them. He was fine. Yeah, exactly. But like, my point is like, Jokic just needs to say, look, man, forget this. I need to go right into the paint because that's what they did in the 90s because it was the most efficient kind of a place to be when there's so much fouling going on that's not being called. Yeah, so it's funny you went that direct. I'm with you on Jokic. Jokic just needs to take the the game by the horns, and I think that he will. Like that's what I expect for Game Seven, and I expect Denver to win uh, win the NBA Finals. And my Jason Tatum sucks take is still alive, and I still stick to it. He sucks. Have you all been watching? Did you watch Cleveland take a game off those guys, and they didn't have anybody? Like what? What a paltry uh, excuse for an NBA superstar. My God, I'm putting me in. I'm the Sixth Man of the Year if he's an NBA superstar. Anyway, <laughs> um, but like if you go back, like. The, the passing teams, like, if you're just kind of a small ball team, like like the KD Warriors would have been fine. The Steph, yeah. Clay, Draymond Warriors, they wouldn't have been okay. But go back and, like, there were some teams that did the passing thing, but they had enough heft to deal um, with the prison ball rules. Like, think about the Sacramento Kings, who were stolen an NBA championship by the oh. NBA referees from your Los Angeles Lakers. They had Weber, and they had Diva. Like, they could do both. And it, it was the combination of both that made them so powerful. Think about, this was a little bit of a different era, obviously, and the rules had lightened up a little bit. But think about what the Spurs did to the Heat. Like, they could go big, but then they could also do the passing thing. And it was the combo of those things where, okay, LeBron, Bosh, you want to muscle us up? We can muscle with you, with Kawhi and Duncan, but we can also, like, whip it around 500 times and you're not going to know what's going to hit you. So I think it's the combo that really that makes the Nuggets decade, so dangerous. But that was a decade into the rules change. You it know, was. It the, was. Spurs, the Spurs moment. The, the Kings are a good example. I mean, look, they are. And, uh, you know, to Rick Adelman's, uh credit, I mean, that was an incredible team. Uh so yeah, that that is the one counter to to the point I'm making. If you think about the '90s, if you think about the early 2000s, Shaq, Kobe, it was all about like, look, playoffs are a moment when you have to take inefficient shots. You know, like all these like nerds who look at Kobe's like shooting, um, you know, like chart, and they're like, wow, this guy was so inefficient. It's like, yeah, but that's because in the playoffs you needed to be inefficient. Uh, you needed to take the inefficient shots because they were the only shots that were available. You know, like, oh, why don't you get a corner three that's open? Like, well, you can't. People will close out in the playoffs. It's difficult to go around the screens. People pull. They, they don't call fouls. And so at the end of the day, what happened in the 90s and early 2000s was that the inefficient shots were the ones that were available. You know, and this is where data, by the way, you can be imprisoned by data. And this is actually relevant to investors listening to this. Um, a Data depends on the context, and sometimes it doesn't reveal the truth. And regular season and playoffs are different. And so in the playoffs, those shots just don't exist anymore because these guys did not club until 5 a.m. You know, they had a good rest, and then they are closing out on three-point lines with with efficiency and elan, you know. Um, and I think that today, what we're seeing when they impose these rules suddenly on, on teams, teams that overpass, that have a very complicated and sort of a intricate, elegant offense – they just can't handle, um, they can't initiate it. And suddenly the New York Knicks, God bless them, with one guy who's six foot one, barely, who just shoots 50 shots from mid range, he's unguardable because that's, you know, that's what you need in a prison ball context. You need that focal point of attack, one on one, 
uh, and simplify the offense. You need to simplify it because the more movement it has, the more opportunity there is for somebody to pull a jersey, to bump, to make these like small fouls you're not calling anymore. Yeah, it's it's funny though. Like you, I, I like the way you went. I thought you were going to go with rising and falling great powers in the wor- in the NBA, like they're rising and falling great powers in the world. Because I mean, we're we're at the conference finals, and there's no LeBron, no KD, no Harden, no Westbrook, no Paul George. Um, I wonder which country you would compare these guys to. Like Westbrook's probably North Korea. That's the only one that jumps off the page oh, to me so in terms mean. of like comparisons. Yeah, I like Russ, but like he's you never know what's going to happen. I don't know which country LeBron is or which one KD are, but like it does feel like a changing of the guard. Like suddenly it's Luca and Shea, um, and it should have been Zion if he hadn't pulled his hamstring. God damn it! Shea's but, another. Um, by the way, Shea is another great example of someone who will do well. I think in this prison ball, he has that mid range game. Very slow, very particular. Uh, by the way, I'm going to pull out something now just to just to ruin your Friday. You know, you know who would be great. great? You know who would be great in this kind oh, of. I know, I know, I know where this is going. What, yeah, you who, do. Who would be say great? it. Say it. No, say no, no, no. You name. say it. I'm not going to no, say you it. Say you do it. it. No, okay. I'm not doing it. You say it. I saw Joe. Oh, I said yeah. The, I thought you were going to. Yeah, I saw Joe's great. I liked I saw Joe. He was. Oh, fine. did you? I thought you were yeah. always anti Joe Johnson. He's fine. I, okay. I had much more problems with Josh Smith than I did with ISO okay, Joe. Fair. Like, yeah. <laughs> like watching Josh you, Smith think he was For those of you listening Joe. to this, you know, uh, Jacob used to be an Atlanta Hawks fan, and, you know, he's now converted to the Pelicans, given I, that I, you live. I thought what you were going to bring up is Russillo and Bill Simmons. I hope they listen to this because they're great most of the time, sure. but sometimes they talk about the smaller markets, and I know they have no idea what the fuck they're talking about because they brought up the idea that it would be a good idea. Uh, for the Pelicans to trade for Trey Young and put Trey next to Zion. And I, I, li- I literally self-immolated on the spot. There is not a worse team in the league that you could send Trey to for Zion's development, anything else. And if they do, like I gave up on the Hawks because they picked Trey over Luka. It would be so terrible for me. Like I have season tickets for the Pelicans. I won't be going to any games if Trey Young is the starting point card of the Pelicans. Just saying. I mean, same, uh, you know, I live in LA, obviously, I'm, I'm a longtime Laker fan, and there are people in my life who are like, what do you think about Trey Young? And I can just see the narrative, like, starting. No, I mean, look, there is, a, th- I mean, there's no team that he's good for. <laughs> No, he's he's a he's a not a winning basketball player. Like yeah. he's, he's just not. And like he wasn't a winning basketball in the non-prison ball rules. Prison ball rules, somebody gets to go after this 5 58 five, Lilliputian who doesn't play defense and thinks he's the best player on the court. Like that's like literally the worst type of player you could possibly have. Trey like he should be a, you know, Jamal Crawford type, you know, That's microwave right. six man. Like he would Irrational be great. Irrational confidence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think he will age into that role. I think he will age and he will, you know, I can even see him being on a championship team in that role as a, you know, you come in, you play against uh, the other team's reserves, uh, subs, and you just go off, you know, you do seven points in a row. Like uh, actually Reggie Jackson, I thought has been, you know, he's much maligned. He was much maligned when he was on the Clippers. Uh, and I think Detroit too, but like he came in and he's given Denver. I mean, first of all, Jamal Murray to me is not a point guard. He, I don't feel confident when he has the ball in his hands. I actually don't. He can do the pick and roll with Jokic, but uh, I don't think he's a point guard. And Reggie Jackson is the when he comes in, it, you're like, wow, you have a professional ball dribbler. Well done, you know. Like, and I think he's done an incredible job in the limited minutes. And that's one day I think where Trey Young will be, but. Uh, for the time being, I think if this is truly the way that things are going to go, if this is the way that the world is going, this prison ball, I kind of like it. And the number one reason I like it is that this is where post play becomes actually efficient, you know, in these in this construct, in this context. And uh, and I think that teams just have to figure that out. And if I was the Mavericks and if I was Denver Nuggets, I would post Luca because nobody can guard him. Like at his at his size. You know, like you can't put a power forward on him because then obviously he'll take them out. But there's no small forward or guard that can guard Luka in the post. And there is probably no one on the planet that can guard Jokic in the post. And I just wouldn't, I wouldn't let them get on there. That's it. Yeah. I mean, let, let's close out with this. I mean, my advice for the Pel, if I was running the Pelicans, what I would try to do this offseason is I would take all the picks, everything I had, I would try to go get Mikhail Bridges. 
I, I would trade BI for Mikhail Bridges and throw in the picks if I could get Bridges on the team. And then I would try to sign CP3 for a little one year Dude, New Orleans wow. reunion. We need the point guard. We need the toughness. We need somebody who's going to kick Zion's ass. Like Dude. show us how it's done for a year, CP3. And put out CP3, Herb, um, you know, Zion. Uh, Zion needs to be probably the center. Like we need to get rid of Jonas. Maybe we can trade him somewhere else. Like that's a well, nice there's, lineup. There's rumors he's coming to the Lakers because AD doesn't want to play center. You know, so. Oh, great. does he still? I was going to ask. So, how are you feeling? What What do you think is going to happen to the Lakers this off season? Are you keeping LeBron? Losing LeBron? D'Angelo? Like, how I, are you feeling? I just don't. I don't care, man. Jacob, it's it's, it's bad. Uh, I don't care. I think. You know, we're going to have JJ <laughs> coaching us oh, and, coaching doing pod- and podcasts with LeBron. And you look, <laughs> at the end of the day, maybe that's a new revenue stream. Uh, maybe that will be that will be cool. Um, no, I look, I think I think the problem here is, um, you know, there's really nothing to do. Um, and you can't complain because you got a title in 2020. So you just have to. So everything that management has done to get the 2020 title, trading for AD, signing LeBron, worked out. They got, you know, how many teams have gotten an NBA title over the last, you know, decade? Not that many. Lakers are one of them. So you can't really be that mad, but I think there's nothing to do. Well, no, you I really, to... like, last year, the Lakers played the Nuggets hard, and they played them hard this year, too. Like, this I, year, too, I, yeah. I like the Lakers' odds against almost anybody else. It was just, like, Jokic, like, takes away the AD thing. Because nobody else has anything that can challenge AD well, the except problem... the Nuggets. Here's what I would say. <clears throat> if you want to get a center like Volashunas, who is great. I mean, he really is. He's he's yeah, he's good. Great. He was the like, greatest he... Lithuanian player in, in the world. Good for him. <laughs> At the time. <laughs> um, well, I mean, Sabonis is better. But, like, look, what I would say is if you're going to have him and AD is going to switch to four, he needs to revisit his mid-range jumper because that was what won the 2020 title for the Lakers. That and, of course, wing defense. Um but I think that having him play the four is not going to work if he's going to be the player he has been for the last three years. He has no confidence in his jump shot. He's put on weight. Uh, he's not nimble. He's not quick. He's not beating fours and fives off the dribble. He just isn't. He used to be able to go to that baseline and go around there very quickly. Um, he squares up. No one's guarding him close because he doesn't have a shot. So he's not a four anymore. And if you're going to bring the five in, I mean, it's it could be disastrous. Yeah. All right, Marco, we got to go. Uh, if the Pelicans do trade for Trey Young, you and I are getting on and doing an emergency podcast, which is to say <laughs> you're going to listen to me scream at the microphone for 10 minutes and be my therapist, okay? That's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. I will definitely do that. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about cognitive investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.